So last year, um, I, I was really excited to be here. I was really thankful that you guys let me come back again. I appreciate that. That's a good gesture. Um, when I saw you last, I was um, 20 pounds lighter. Um, I, I put on 20 pounds this last year. Can you see it? Can you see it now? <laughs> Can you see now, everybody? Side view? Just in case, just so you know, it's there. I'm just holding it all in. Um, I, I say that because I don't, I'm not, I'm, I have many faults, but I'm not, I don't lie. I don't tell lies. Um, but I'm going to be honest because we're off the record and being recorded. Um, <laughs> I flat out lied at the DMV today. Because <laughs> I'm from Minnesota, but I don't live here. And so today, this afternoon, I had 30, like 31 minutes to go renew my driver's license, which is up in April because I won't be back. And I went in there and they were like, you know, is everything the same? And I just said yes. And it wasn't. Because of this. But, but I plan on, oh, yeah, confession after? Yeah, perfect. He already had me. I heard him talking. Let's we'll make sure we turn the mic off first. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, just a little bit of a background. We did. We adopted three kids. The last time I saw you, we only had two kids. Um, and if you remember, we had been married about 12 years without any kids. And then one weekend, we just had two kids. And that was a shocker because my wife was studying 14 hours a day. So it was just me and then these two kids. And I feel more bad for them, you know, that they got stuck with me. And I would hold the crying baby. I wouldn't even know what to do. I would just, like, I'd try to dial the phone to call my mom. Like, what do you do when they're, I don't know. He's just going to the bathroom all the time. Like, <laughs> and then so we thought, well, you know, we've had a good year or so to get used to it. We should just toss another one in there. So we, um, it wasn't, um, let's see. Well, I guess when I saw you, we were in process. And so uh, over the summer, we finished the whole process, and now we have all three of them. And if I was a good dad, I would have their picture up somewhere, but I'm not, so I don't. Um, but they're there, I promise. They exist, I swear. Um, and they're doing great uh, living in New York City. They went from the smallest island in the Caribbean to uh, the largest city in the United States of America, and they eat it up. They love it. They love the train. They love the subway. We do get um, a lot of looks on the, on the trains because... People do the math, like they look and they see us and like, oh, and then they see our kids and wait a minute, they don't look anything like them. Like, you know, a different skin color and the afro. I try to do the afro, <laughs> but like my, one of my favorite things about having the kids is that I can just poof their hair up. I, I want hair like that so bad, I will just touch it. And they're like, you're weird, dad. And but you'll see people on, uh, on the, the train just kind of looking at it and then they're like, they're okay with it. But if you guys know the O'Neills, um, they're back there. If you don't know them, you do now. Um, if you guys would stand up for just a real quick second, just, just to embarrass you. Ah, there you go. So that's Bill O'Neill and Pam O'Neill. So they're like second parents to me. And uh, actually I was at their house, was it yesterday? And I was upstairs and they had some people come over and to look at the house. And um, I came down the stairs and I'm like, hey mom, hey dad. And they were like, oh, that's not our son. And I was like, what? Mom, why would you do that? It's totally great. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> their daughter, Whitney, lives with us out east right now in New York City. It's just because she's one of our best friends. And so, she, so we go on the subway, and so then there's me and these two women and then these kids, and the math just gets all messed up. People have, and I, I love it. Sometimes I'll just walk away and leave them on the train with the kids. It totally messes everyone up. Um, but one of the, the other thing I just can't wait to tell everybody on earth. So my wife started medical school eight years ago, or she started pre-med eight years ago. We moved back from China in 2006 knowing God called us to be missionaries and that she, God was calling my wife to be a doctor. And if you know anything about the process, it's grueling. And so three years of pre-med at Scholastica, and then she didn't get accepted to med school the first year. So it was a whole year of just waiting and praying, like, God, did we make a mistake? And then she got accepted into med school down in the Caribbean. And so we, we moved down there. And so that was four whole years. And she finishes that up on May 30th. She'll be an MD. But if you know the process, you, you have to get accepted to a residency in order to, to progress. As a, I mean, if you don't get into a residency, you don't get to be a doctor. I mean, you're, you have the stamp and the diploma, but you're not, you can't practice. And so it's the huge, huge day, and it's the pinnacle of the med student's whole process. And it was today. And um, so I was at Dunn Brothers in Eden Prairie just sitting there, like, because the, the email comes at 12 o'clock Eastern time, on the dot. Every, every med student in the country receives the email, and it's, did you match or not? The match is what it's called. Did you or not? And so she got the email, and you know, she, she, she got me on the phone, and she was on there, and she was like, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could open the email. And I'm like, do you want me to open the email? And she's like, no, I don't want you to go anywhere near the email. I just want... 
And so, uh, so we just, just, she prayed, and we decided, okay, God, whatever the outcome is, then, you know, whatever, she clicked it, and she screamed, because she matched. So my wife is done now. She, 14-hour days for years upon years, and she's, she's in now. I mean, it gets way worse in the residency, and I know that, but, like, but this is just a great day for us. So I was really excited to get to tell you guys that. Um, and now comes the serious part of the evening, and we'll begin. Um, but tonight, you, you know, the title is, you know, Thank God Life is Not Fair. And we're learning about grace and mercy. And this is a time of Lent, a time of preparation, a time of purification, when we're supposed to be really digging in and getting rid of things in our lives. And, and just letting the light of God shine into maybe the dark parts that we hide all year round. We're supposed to let God in at this point. And, um, and it seems weird to start talking about grace when we're not even to the resurrection yet. We're still at the, your sins killed God and all of that. And that's very true. It's very heavy. But we would be remiss as a church, we would be remiss as Catholics, if we didn't lace everything we do with grace and mercy. If the last word on our lips isn't grace and mercy, we need to change things. And so I got really excited to get to talk about this. And so what I'm going to do, one of the things I've started doing more and more, I don't know if you have a pen or paper or anything, it is recorded, but um, the catechism of the church, you can, get it on, I mean, you can read it online for free, you can search it online, keywords and everything, it's amazing, at the usccb.org. The catechism of the church, you should be running to that daily. When you have questions about the church, you, know, you go to Father, absolutely, but if you're at home and he won't answer his phone or something, and he's busy in confession with Nick, then go to the catechism. Because it's endless. It's, as a speaker, I don't need anything but just give me a word for a topic. And the catechism, the, the church has already laid it out. Here's what we believe. And so the, the catechism is just my daily, it's just beautiful, it's, it's mind-blowing. So tonight, I'm just going to go mostly off of one paragraph in the catechism, 1439. So if you want to, if you, some way to remember that, 1439. And we're going to dissect it and, and go through the process of understanding grace through this one paragraph in the catechism. Um, and it talks about the parable of, parable of the prodigal son the center of which is the merciful Father. Now I'm aware that uh, it's, it's the fourth Sunday of Lent year A that, that actually talks about, or year C. It's not this year, either way. It's, we, we don't talk about the prodigal son this year. But that content, the, the story of the prodigal son, is what should, should be like the, the topic of our lives. And so I, I'll begin, I'm going to read through it real fast, and then we'll, we'll go back through. So you may, uh, you may notice that this is different than my conversion story. I, I got a second chance to come back. And I really, last year I got to talk about myself. I got to, like our conversion and all of that and the beauty of the church and that's true. But I would, I don't want to leave without getting to instruct a little bit and to hopefully get you one step closer to opening the catechism and making it part of your life. So 1439, it says the parable of the prodigal son, the center of which is the merciful father. And it talks about all the aspects of it. And it says this, the fascination of illusory freedom, the abandonment of the father's house, the extreme misery in which the son finds himself after squandering his fortune, his deep humiliation at finding himself obliged to feed swine, and still worse, at wanting to feed on the husks that the pigs ate. His reflection on all he has lost, his repentance and decision to declare himself guilty before his father, the journey back, the father's generous welcome, the father's joy. And so that, that's, that's, the, that's the whole paragraph. He talks about this whole list of things. It goes on a little bit at the end, and I'll trail off. This whole list of the process that the prodigal son goes through, we're going to dissect that. But I want to point out something, and you may already know this. This may be common knowledge for you. But notice the phrasing in the opening of that paragraph. It's the parable of the prodigal son, the center of which is the merciful father. We like to call the story the prodigal son because it's all about us. Because I, yes, I'm the prodigal. And we love that. We love being the center of the story. The center of the story is the merciful father. The center of every page of scripture, the center of every sentence, the point of every period and comma of scripture is God the merciful father. And if we don't know that, then everything gets askew because we don't think of him as the merciful father. We think of either us or we think of him as a tyrant or somebody we should run to and that we can't trust. And all the while, every beat of your heart, your whole life, God is your merciful father just wanting to extend mercy to you, desiring to be intimate in your life and show you grace and mercy. So we're going to go through the first stage of that is the fascination of illusory freedom. You know the story of the prodigal son. He, he's a wealthy landowner, and he has two sons. And the one son comes to the dad, and he says, I want my inheritance. And I'm sure you've heard that, that the act of the son going to the father and saying, I want my inheritance. When does a child get an inheritance? When their parent dies. That's when you get what you inherit. 
You inherit it when your father passes away. And here the son goes into his dad's office and says, I want the money that I'll get when you die, I want it now. Which is basically saying, I kind of wish you were dead. I want what I want, and I, you're in the way, so can you just give it to me? And all of us, what would we, you're grounded. <laughs> we would not be like, all right, sure, let me write a check. But what do we see the merciful father do? He says, okay, if, if this is what you truly want, here. And he gives him his inheritance. And at all ages, we think we want zero rules, zero boundaries. We think we know what we want. We, we think that we will be happiest without any sort of boundaries on us, without any sort of rules. Our, something in our mind tells us, gosh, if the church would just get off my back, I could just be free to live my life. Oh, if this God monkey wasn't always there, making me do things, making me kneel, and all the Catholic calisthenics and all of that. If he wasn't there, like, making me like a puppet, I could be truly happy. And that's what we feel. But I, I've seen firsthand what it looks like when you don't have rules. Um, so we line up for things here. You go to the DMV or anywhere, you go to the, a restaurant, you line up. And we all know it. There's, no, there's nothing that really says stand here and here's your personal bubble space. But we have that. I mean, if I, I mean honestly, if, I'm, if I did the whole talk right here, <laughs> I would not just freak Tim out. Everybody nearby is like, whoa, easy freak, what are you doing? Because we have just to get, isn't that weird? We, we, I didn't really, I would not do that. I, I did. Um, we have a, just a, a, a set in personal bubble space. But I lived in China for two years, and that's not even in their vocabulary. There's nothing about that country that has a personal boundary space. Um, my boss had lived there for 13 years, and his wife loved to watch him, his, his name is Howard, watch Howard at like dinner parties where Americans were, because she would watch him push people around the room. Because he'd step close to talk to them, and they would, without knowing it, they would just step back. And he wouldn't even think about it. He would just step closer to them, and they would step away. And she would, she would watch him just push them around the room, <laughs> having a conversation. And all the while, he didn't even know what he was doing. They were just so awkward. Well, in China, man, I, I remember being at the counter trying to order food. And it's just, if God gave you long arms, you win. That's, that's how you get to the front of the line. No, no lie. That's, that's the rule of the game. If there is a rule, it's if your fingers are farthest up, you win. And then the guy at the checkout, he ignores the other 900 people and just looks at the one that has the long arms. So I don't, and I'm short, so I hated China. <laughs> or at least going to get things there. But one, the worst moment for me, because I, I like people a lot. I really enjoy people. I have never, like, wanted to punch anyone, um, but I wanted to punch this old lady. Because we were trying to get in line, and it, it is, it's, um, you, you make sure your wallet's in the front, and you're just wedged in, trying to get up somewhere, and I was the next, I had the next longest arm, and from underneath me, like a 130-year-old Chinese woman just went like that, up under my armpit, and I went, ow, and she was like, ah, I couldn't believe, and she was serious, and my wife, she saw it happen, and she knows me, like, that's just, uh, rudeness, I just don't like it, and so I kind of stepped forward, like, what was I going to do? I mean, she would still kick my butt, but, like, <laughs> lean forward and try to get my arm again, she was already under me, and she won, like, that, that was, that was what happens when there's no rules, it's just like, whatever you want, whatever you say goes, I mean, we, we think we don't want rules, but we get in our car, and we get really mad if anyone's, like, even too close to us in the car, right? Like, road rage in Minnesota is crazy, because you hear the lie about Minnesota nice, and that's just a flat-out lie. <laughs> Not behind their vehicles and tractors and snowmobiles, nuh-uh. It's chaos out there when you cross somebody. I, but it's too much. There's too many stories of road rage. We think we don't want rules. We think we want God off our back. So we're all like that first son. And we go to God, and we say, just give me what I want, Give me what I deserve, and I'll go on with my life. And you can go on with yours, and you can have your church built. And the man turned around and did this. Oh, too bad. And then walked in. I, that's the day I lost faith in humanity. It is. Because I had been told all my life, as you get older, you get more mature. And that's a flat-out lie. I still have images of this sweet old man. Just, oh, too bad. <sighs> So we did the Christian thing, and we cut his brake line, and we moved on. <laughs> no big deal. God is good. But the catechism calls that illusory, like an illusion, because there's no such thing as freedom without rules. That's not freedom. That ends up being slavery. If you've ever seen 
a little kid whose parents never gave him any rules. We don't call him like a well-behaved, awesome, fully functioning human being. We call him a spoiled brat. Because there's something dysfunctional, well, dysfunctional about not having boundaries and not knowing what is right and wrong and doing it. Because we're not made to just be free. We're made to be free to do what is right. So it's illusory. True freedom is to be able to choose and do the right thing. And it's like this. I've been telling people, for, um, actually some of the DLs, or the, the leaders, and Kayla, they know this. I feel like at one point in our life, we were dropped, when you were conceived in your mother's womb, and God made you, and made you into humanity, he dropped you into his river of grace, his river of life, where you didn't do anything to, to merit that, you just were given life. We call it the gift of life. And we always kind of think of it as like, the gift of life is this one-time event, like he, at conception. But the church teaches, true gift of life is that every second, every heartbeat, every breath you've ever taken has been sustained by that gift of life, because you're still alive. You are sustained by gift. You're in a river of just gift. You're just, you know those lazy rivers like at uh, Valley Fair? Like the, in the water park that lets, you know where the kids go to just pee, right? That's what it is. That's all it is. It's the only thing that is. Like people just, you're wedged in and everybody floats at like one mile an hour and it's too warm for comfort. Well, on an even better sense, like a mountain stream, you, we were dropped into a river and for so long, as, as people, as individuals, we float down that river. We receive. What do we do? When you're, you know, when you're uh, two days old, you're not doing anything to provide food for yourself. You're just receiving. Not just your breath, not just your heartbeat. You're receiving from your parents. Everything is gift, and you're just held up by gift. There's not what I want, what I want to do. It's just, I just I'm going to go with it. This is this river of life. I'm just floating down. But at some point in our lives... We get to a point where everything we've ever had has been given to us, and we, we, we get to a certain height where we realize, wait a minute, I can, I can plant my feet. I don't need to float down any river. I, I don't need to go where it wants me to. I can stay right here if I want to. And so then we start to look around. We're no longer like this, just receiving. We're, we're looking around. Oh, well, that, I want that. So we fight the current. We fight sideways to get what we want. We, we see things up here that we want. We fight against the current to get what we want. Sometimes it's downstream, and it feels right. But sometimes, I mean, are any of you like that? At the end of your day of relentless pursuit of what you thought you wanted, you're exhausted and cranky and angry and let down by life. Because you thought you knew, I don't need these laws or these rules. I, I know what I want, and I'm going to go for it. You plant your feet, and you fight as much as you can. Why do you think it's so exhausting? Because you're fighting every second of the process. You're fighting the current of grace and gift and life. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, their whole existence, I mean, we see it in Scripture, their whole existence, everything they ever needed was given to them by God. Their hands were open, their eyes were up, and everything they need, they would receive from Jesus, from God. And at some point, the snake comes in, and what does he say? You don't, you don't need him. He's just keeping you down. He's not a loving father. He's an evil tyrant. And all you need to do is drop your eyes. The fruit is right there. Just grab it. You don't need God. You don't need him. You don't need to wait on anybody. He knows that you'll just be like him if you do. So just do it. Reach out. So what do they do? Their eyes drop and their hands turn and they grasp for what they want. And we look back and we're like, oh, Adam, oh, Eve, why did you do that? We do the same every day. I know a paycheck's going to make me happy. And if the paycheck itself doesn't make me happy, what I can buy with it will. I know that if I just get my marriage right, I'll be happy. If I can just get settled and pay off the loan, if I can just have the right amount of kids, if my kids will just behave even for 10 minutes, I will be happy. If I can get my three-year-old to stop burning things, I think I would be eternally happy. <laughs> and we put happiness somehow in the future, the if, the if, the if. If I can get this, if this will happen, that's all Adam and Eve did. There's an illusory happiness, a fake happiness that relentlessly pursued. So we have the fascination of illusory freedom that took the son and the abandonment of the father's house. Everything he ever had was in that house. Everything he needed. Every time he wanted to have a party, they'd kill the fatted calf and they had everything they wanted. And he abandoned that father's house. He went off on his own. He left the provision, the protection, and he left the love of his father. He left relationship with his father. And he abandoned it for what? For what he wanted. He just left it for what he thought he wanted. And 
we do this. I've seen, I've seen my five-year-old daughter <laughs> turn to absolute sobbing, weeping tears because she couldn't have a little piece of wood that my son was holding that they had pulled off of a bigger piece of wood. <laughs> it wasn't a toy like that we got from a toy store. There was a piece of wood laying there and Davey, my three-year-old, pulled a piece off of it because he's insanely strong. And then Esther wanted it, and when she couldn't have this piece of wood off of a bigger piece of wood, it was utter chaos. Like, things were levitating and bursting into flames, and it was horrible. <laughs> and I remember in that moment being like, but that's what I do every day. I see something I want, and at the end of the day, God didn't bless me with it, and so I'm upset. I saw something I wanted out of my wife, and I didn't get it, so at the end of the day, I'm upset. And sometimes we leave this church on Sunday, we leave the Father's house... The actual house. And whatever happened right here, whatever this happened to offer, the salvation and the goodness that this would give, we just leave it behind and we walk out. I, I didn't say this last year, but when I, went to my, when I was first going to Masses, that you get to the end of Mass and the priest says, you know, back in the day, he would say, you know, the Mass has ended, go in peace. And everybody to my eyes would be like, oh, thanks be to God. That's what it seemed like to me, like, they just can't wait. Yeah, thanks be to God, let's get out of here. And before he's even down, they're just out. And that's, that's a true, actual, like, abandonment of the Father's house and what just happened. I like the way they say it now, or one of the options. Go, glorifying God by your lives. You don't get your get-out-of-jail-free card. The last words you hear, are, you make sure you glorify God by your life. That's all that matters. But we, like the sun, we fall for it. Um... Christopher West does a lot of theology of the body speaking. He's like the preeminent dude. And he tells a story of his son when he was, uh, his, his son had eaten dinner just fine. And so he was giving him dessert. And his son wanted Oreos. And so he had a package of Oreos, the individual. And he was opening it up by his son. And he was about to give it to him. And the kid grabbed it out of his hand. Snatched it from him. Just grabbed it right from his dad's hand. And, he, and Christopher West, he was like, wait, no, 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 no. What, what, I was going to... I was going to give that to you. I had good things to give from you. And you just took it from me. And humanity, now I want you to know, it gets better. This is, this is the low point. You're like, Nick used to be happy last year. Well, that was before kids. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But if we're going to go anywhere with God, if we're going to find happiness, we first have to actually be willing to open our minds and admit where maybe we've screwed it up. As humanity and then as individuals. And we, there's a reason the prodigal son, the story of the, the compassionate father, is in here. Because that is us. That is our story. We all bolt. We all grasp and run. Whereas in Eden, we go back to the Garden of Eden, up until the point of the fall, everything was complete gift. Actually, Adam and Eve, in their body, that's like a fundamental theology of the body, they knew how to make a gift of their body. On all fronts, whether it was intimacy between those two, whether it was the work that Adam did, whether it was procreation, whether it was child bearing, bearing, child raising, all of it. They knew how in this flesh to be a gift. Because life is gift. Love is gift. I talked, if any of you have fifth graders or sixth graders, I talked to them about that today. We got to talk about that we were actually made to give. We're made to give of ourselves, and we're happiest when we do, and we're most miserable when we take. And I was quick to tell them, your parents probably don't know this. You need to go show them what giving looks like. So don't be surprised if some of them offer to do something nice around the house tonight. I told them that if any of you go home and offer to take out the trash, they're probably going to think, what did you do? Where did you put it? <laughs> like, so we have the fascination of illusory freedom, the abandonment of the father's house, the extreme misery in which the son finds himself after squandering his fortune. The end of your day. Do you ever feel that way? Like you, you go to bed and you're like, I kind of squandered that. Those little hits, like at the end of just a day. You're like, man, I, not only did I not do justice to the day, I just bombed. I... I undermined everyone around me. I didn't once act in a loving manner. Instead, I just took and took and took. I started to view everyone around me, my spouse, my job, my kids, as personal ATMs that I could get what I want from them. And you don't have to raise your hands because I know you all do it. We all do it. We get to the end of some of our days and it's these, this minuscule Eden again. 
we just dropped our eyes and we grasped. But what about the end of your life? We as Christians, we as Catholics, we should have what my, um, my old boss in Duluth, he called the horizon of eternity in mind. We should always have the horizon of eternity in our sights. We should always be thinking beyond just this. And so if I breathe my last tonight, what did I do with this amazing gift that I had? And please, this is not a guilt talk. I don't like talks that are like, what are you doing with your life? You're just messing it up. It's not that at all. There's utter hope to it. But we have to first ask the question, what am I doing? I was given 24 hours today. What, just not a judgmental, what did you do? What did I do? Well, I fed my kids. I worked real hard. Awesome. I wanted to run somebody over because they didn't use a blinker. Not so awesome. Just looking at the examination of conscience, getting to the end of your day, but saying, what about at the end of my life, with the gift that I was given, this gift that was started when I was conceived, what am I doing with it? Was I made to do what I'm doing right now? That should be your question. Did God create humanity and create you as unique and unrepeatable so that you would do what you're doing today? Did he make you to be your job? Or did he make you for something more? In Eden, as a result of the fall, as a result of what they squandered, they were cursed. They were kicked out. Death entered the world. We're given every day where we can bring life to those around us. Where we can extend goodness and mercy to the world around us. And oftentimes at the end of my day, I just went around turning off lights. Making it as dark as I could everywhere around me. We all experience those moments where they got kicked out of Eden on a daily basis. Now keep in mind, I have a smile on my face because there's hope. So not only do we have the fascination of illusory freedom, we have the abandonment of the father's house, we have the extreme misery in which the son finds himself after squandering his fortune, we have his deep humiliation at finding himself obliged to feed swine. The son of the landowner, the millionaire child, is now feeding pigs. And we've all felt that. That, what am I doing? We've all, at the end of our day, felt that little bit of recognition. It's like, what did I do? I, I had such an opportunity today, and I squandered it. But he goes even farther. And still worse, I know, it gets worse. Isn't that awesome? Yes. And still worse at wanting to feed on the husks that the pig ate. Like a junkie doing things no one in their right mind would do in order to get what they need. Not only is he feeding pigs, he finds himself looking at their food saying, I, I would eat that. He went from having everything handed to him out of love to wishing he could eat what the pigs were eating. And if we want to go farther with Christ, if we want to know what true life is, we just have to step back and realize that's what we've done with our lives. And if that's the end of the story, that's horrible. That's, that's condemnation. It's guilt. Run out of here and never come back if that's the actual story, if that's the ending. And sometimes you might have felt that way in your life. You might have felt like, I'm not going to church again because I know the same old story. Over and over. You're wrong, you're wrong. It's Catholic guilt, right? You guys are familiar with that, right? Well, I grew up in the Assemblies of God, the AG, and we call ourselves the always guilty. <laughs> it's not a strictly Catholic thing. If we don't hear the whole message, if we don't have the ending, the end game preached to us, then why would we ever set foot through these doors? And I didn't. When I was in college in Minneapolis, I left. I was an atheist. I, um, I had a day at North Central... Bible College, North Central University, where I gave up on God, I, I won't do it, I gave the double middle finger to the altar, and I walked right, in front of 1,200 people, I walked right out. I stormed up to my dorm room, I was so mad at religion and God and all of it. I stormed to my room, and I called my mom, I said, Mom, it's a joke, I don't believe, I'm done. And there was this pause, and I expected Mom to be like the angry God that I thought existed. I thought God was so upset that I said that, he was so mad at my fingers. And I expected my mom to be that way. 
And there was this pause, and my mom just said, all right. If you die an atheist, I'll always love you. Call me next week. Click. <laughs> totally diffused. Every, I sat there going, what just happened? I just did probably the worst thing I could think of to do. And my mom was like, all right, love you, bye. And that's more than Minnesota night. It was something else. In one of my worst moments, this moment of love from my mom that spoke what mercy sounds like. Have you ever been really mad at God? Really mad. You find yourself in all the filth, wanting to eat the pig slop, and you blame God? We all do that. Why did you let me get here? You walk out and you start, like, God's like, why? I, what? You wanted to. You put yourself, why are you blaming me? But we expect God to be up there and be like, how dare you question me? How dare you, you know, raise your face to me like the great and powerful Oz? That's what we, don't we? I mean, let's just, okay, it's just me and I'm a failure. Thanks. <laughs> Haven't we sat here before and looked up and just been like, whatever? Just whatever. You don't even know me. You don't even care. You're just silent. And we've all done that. But the story doesn't end there. Because all the while that we're railing and ranting and angry and lost, God's heart is beating with mercy for us. He never looked away from us. Never clicked his tongue at us. Never said, man, you could do so much better. Ah, if you would just. So what we see in here, he reflects on all that he lost. Because in the, in the passage, he says, the servants back home in my father's house have it better than I do. Those who just served my dad have it better. He knows the goodness. When he really thinks about it, at the bottom of the pit, he knows, I know what to do. I know where to go. So he says, I'll admit my guilt. I'll go home. But I won't even try to be a son. I know I'm not worthy to even be a son. But I'll go home to him because I know he's good, and I'll just ask if I can work on the farm. His repentance and his decision to declare himself guilty. He says, I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. In Lent, we get to go to confession. Now, if, if I may say so, I would, I would think that you could go to confession once a week. I would say that it would do you well. To go. I, go to, I go every Saturday. And I, I can't say whether I need it or not, because I always, always need it. And this is what we do in confession. We say, Father, I've sinned. I sinned against you. I sinned against heaven. And I want to come back. And if we had a God in heaven who was like us, or maybe our earthly father, he would say, well, let me think about it. Or, well, gosh, I don't, I don't want to forgive you, but I have to because you said the words. Have you ever done that at confession? Like, he, like I'm going to say these, and he doesn't want to forgive me, but he has to because I know the key. It's a code. I have it on a card, and I say it, and I win. That's not it at all. God waits in the person of Christ, in the person of the priest, in the confessional, just like antsy, just like, I was waiting for you to come. I'm so glad you're here. I want to tell you something. I love you. No, but I, I said, when I said my first confession at 29 years old, it was like a notebook full. Like the three dividers in there. Trapper keeper, Velcro, all of it. Just. The priest is falling asleep and taking shifts. And I got, it took me a full hour, a full 60 minutes to say my first confession. And I got done and the priest said, hey, good confession. And I thought, oh, I see I have a deaf priest. That's great. You didn't hear anything I just said, Father. He's like, yeah, I heard every word. Good confession. Make your act of contrition. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I, I, no, no, no. We should go again. I'll read it again. You must have dozed or got distracted. No, I didn't get distracted. Just make your act of contrition. Like an eager Jesus saying, just come on, get over with. I want to forgive you. Just hurry up. Let's do this right. We have the son who decides to journey home. And you know he has to make a journey to get home. He's not like next door. He does his whole journey back to prepare his speech. To look at what he did. And he walks up 
And it says, when he was a long way off, the father saw him. And the scriptures say that the landowner, the father, ran to meet him. You might have heard this before. But a wealthy landowner didn't run to anybody. It's like the godfather. You stay behind your desk. People come to you. That's, that's what's implied in the story. That's why they included that in there. The, the rich millionaire who everybody comes to him, he sees his son and he takes off running and he falls down at his son's feet. And his son starts his speech. His son's, oh, father, I, I, this. he doesn't even get to finish it. His father says, no, 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 no. You're home. You're back. And all the things that he had prepped and all the things he was mulling over in his head about how horrible he was, the father didn't care about any of it. The father wanted his son back in his life. The father's joy. The father is not a reluctant forgiver. He's not reluctant to forgive your sins. It is why we have the crucifix. It is why we are in this room. It is why you are Catholic. He is eager to forgive. If he wasn't, he would not have sent his own son to die for your sins. He would not have sacrificed anything. He would have dragged his feet, tried to find another way, hemmed and hawed, and he sent his beloved son. The verse from just yesterday. For God so loved the world, he loved you so much, he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him, whoever turns and runs back to him, will not die but have eternal life. Have you ever had a moment where you held either your spouse or your child, and you just didn't want it to end? You know, that's a moment where you touch God's love. Because with God's love, if we keep in God's love, if we return to him and his mercy and let it flood over us, we get eternity in his embrace. Because that's what we are intended for. Now, there's this weird aspect that they include. There were two sons. You know that, right? You, you've heard the other side of the story. The dad's out there, and he's like, yeah, hey, he's back. And they got cool clothes on him, and they're killing animals and cooking them. And the son is out in the field, and he comes back in, and he's like, hey, what's going on? One of the servants is like, your brother's back. They killed the bad kid. We're having a party, man. He's home. And we would expect him to be like, yes, I missed him. But what does he do? He does what we all do when we see other people going to confession. Well, I can't believe it. I didn't do anything. I stayed here the whole time. I've been working in the fields day in and day out. He's squandering the inheritance. He's eating pig slop. He's making a fool of himself. I'm here working. I never left the father's side. How dare he? And he goes to the dad. He's like, what is the deal? I, I did all of this. Why does he get the fatted calf? You know what God says? He's not even mad at him. He says, son... Everything I have is yours. You, anytime you want, go ahead. But in this moment, my son who was lost has come home. And there are times that we're that second brother. There are times when people here at St. Hubert's fail. And they fall and we pounce on them. We vulture them. Whether or not they even know we do it. In our minds, in our hearts, we criticize, we critique well, I know what's going on in their life. They shouldn't be going up to communion. Ooh, I know their mistakes. How dare they? Why would they even show up? And we do that forgetting that most of the time we're the other brother. Most of the time we're eating pig slop. Most of the time we're out punching our ATM to get what we want. And the father's response is the same to both. Listen, I love you. Let all that go and just be with me. And he's saying that to you in Lent. I love you. I know what you've done. Bring it to the sin bin. Go to confession. Get it out of the way. Get stuff out of the way between us and be one with me. Let me change you. Let me hold you. And it's not fair. That's what the son says. It's not fair. We do that all the time. It's not fair. Gifts aren't based on fairness. On your birthday. It's not actually fair that everybody around you has to go spend money on you. Just because you came out of the womb. <laughs> like, ah, uh, 37 years ago, I didn't do anything. Can I have a present? <laughs> and not just from one of you. Can we have a party where you all give me stuff? That's not fair. 
I felt that before, especially with three kids now, and other people are like, hey, we have to get a gift for this party. I'm like, that's not fair at all. I have to feed the children. I have to feed my kids. Gifts aren't fair. They're gifts. And that's what love does. It gives. That's what God does. He gives. Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God. It's really pivotal that you understand this. Grace is unfair. Grace is not merited on your behalf. We need grace because we sin, not because we're awesome. We need grace because we have fallen on our faces. It's unmerited. And there's two reasons I want you to know that. Normally, I would stop at this first reason. I want you to know that God's grace is free to you. That you can, I've gone to confession twice in a 24-hour period, and the priest is like, whoa, you're again? Okay, all right, you're back? Okay. And I'm like, don't judge me. <laughs> but we need grace every minute of our lives, and it's free and undeserved, and it will never, ever run out. Thank God life is not fair. If life was fair, we all deserved hell. But life is not fair. Life is good. Life is not fair. Life is Him. We, we, have our, we have our Savior who stood in our place. Who took every whipping you should have gotten. It's one of my favorite lines in Hamlet. If we give every man what he deserves, who would escape whipping? all deserve it. And instead, someone stepped in front of it for us and took the scars on his back. When we deserved to die for our sin, because sin brings death, the wages of sin is death. When we deserved that, what did we get? We got Christ. We got the Son of God. We got free, undeserved mercy. And every time you approach confession, you bathe yourself in mercy. Every time you approach the altar to receive the Eucharist, you are saying yes to his mercy and love for you. You are saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry. And he comes and he becomes part of you and he changes you from the inside. He transforms your very existence into divinity. Every Sunday at Mass, you have the gospel. Gospel literally means good news. Some of us think it, think it means nap time or like pocket texting. We have the gospel according to John, the gospel of Matthew. What you need to hear is when that happens, when they walk with the gospel and they begin to read the good news for you today from John, the good news from John 3.16 to open our minds to the fact that every single Mass, they speak good news to us. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Because if you were the only person who ever lived, he would still die for you. He loves you. He made you. And that's the first reason I want you to know that grace is free. That it's there for anyone who returns to God. Anyone who finds themselves a million miles away from where they should be. And they know it. And they, they sit on the edge of their bed and they know. They see the darkness of where they are. Anyone who even the slightest turn and decides to go back to God. He is running for you. He is pursuing you to fall down and take you into his arms. Regardless of where you've been this week. I want you to know that for yourself. I also really need you to know it for others. Because we shouldn't stop at, oh, that was good for me. That was a great message for me. I feel loved. I'm glad you feel loved. I want you to know God's mercy. But I want you to know that it is free for everybody. I want you to know, and what I mean is this. When you walk out of here tonight, you've heard hopefully some good news. I want you to walk out and tell that to other people. When they offend you, when they cut you off, when the Chinese people elbow you in the armpit, when everything is unfair, 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 unfair. I want you to turn around and give grace. Be a channel of God's grace to the world around you. 
Years ago, before I was Catholic, I was going to church at um, Christians in Action Church on the campus of the U of M. Or, yeah, U of M. And my pastor, he was preaching about how God gives you the cor- a certain corner of the world. And that you don't need to change the world, you just have your corner. And he stopped for a second, and there was this pause, and then he said, Clean your corner! And then he went on with his sermon again. Because it had built up, he's like, you just clean the area you're in. You guys are given the corner of the world, Chanhassen, your job, your workplace, your home. Clean it. Bring grace and mercy wherever your feet go. Bring mercy to the jerks and the bullies and the rude people and the ones who don't deserve it. Because they are you. We can't be called Christians if we don't. Jesus is very clear. I can't forgive you if you won't forgive others. You don't, there's no way even logically to enter into my grace and mercy if you're withholding judgment on everybody around you. You can't do it. Because you're not actually, you don't even know what mercy is to receive it. Because in order to receive mercy, you have to recognize that you're the prodigal son. You squandered everything. You slammed your father. You took everything and ruined it. And you admit that first. And when you're, when you're in that position, when you realize, this is what I am, this is what I've come to, it's really difficult to judge everyone around you. But when mercy, after my first confession, when my life flooded with grace and mercy, after all I had said and done in 29 years, and I walked out of there just walking on sunshine, <laughs> it was way hard for me to judge people, but it was way easier for me to give out mercy. To just be, you know what, it doesn't matter, don't worry about it. I love you. God loves you. No, but I'm really sorry. I did. No, don't even. Don't worry about it. I love you. The whole world changes when we stop harboring and trying to get mercy for ourselves and forgiveness. And oh, we want so much forgiveness, but we can't offer it to the world. We get closed off and dead. But there is good news. And the good news isn't that nothing's wrong. That would be a lie. The good news is that there's an antidote. The good news is that there is an answer. There is a way, there is some truth, and there is life. That's the gospel. In A Christmas Carol, every year that I watch it and read it, it gets deeper and deeper. My wife got me onto that. So every year we'll read it together and watch all the versions of it. It gets deeper and deeper to me. And there's the scene when he goes to the scary one, the ghost of the future. Christmas yet to come. And he's on his knees in front of the, the ghost. And the ghost won't speak. He's just darkness and fear. And Scrooge says, why are you telling me this if there's no hope to change? I love that moment. Like, and, and so if, if the gospel ended there, you're all evil. Go in peace. <laughs> like, then you say, why did you even tell me if there's no hope? But there is hope. I always liken it to if we're in a burning building... And we're on a 100-story building, and we're on the 98th floor. And we're trapped. The exit's no, going up, and the exit's going down. We're stuck. And the windows are broken out, and we're going to die. And we're all in it. And I start running around, just pointing out the situation. We're all going to die. There's so much fire. I'm not helping the situation at all. I'm being characteristic of Nick, but I'm not helping the situation at all. Because that's exactly what I would be doing, just running around. But say we're in the middle of this chaos, and from out of the window we hear a voice. Saying, you guys are in need of some help. And we look out, and floating there is the last son of Krypton, Superman. And the cape is billowing behind him, and his muscles are rippling. And he says, boy, you guys are in a tight spot. We would immediately feel hope. Because we would know he could, he could save us. He would remedy the situation. When the Gospels come along, and sometimes they are challenging. And in Lent, they're supposed to be challenging. In Lent, we're supposed to be whittling away at the dark parts of us and the rough parts of us. And Jesus comes along and he says some things that are tough for us. And it can be tempting to be like, come on, you're just pointing out a bad situation. But his words only offer hope. He has no, nothing else to speak to you except hope. And the words are this. Um, I used to want to be an astronaut so bad. All, I, um, I, my parents bought me one of those murals, like it's wallpaper, and it does the whole wall. 
And it was just the fish out of Columbia floating above the earth. And I would lay in bed, and I would try to, like, put my feet up and pretend like I was up there. Which is dumb, because you just go get a life, play with some people. But that's not what I did. I just laid in there trying to be in space. I wanted to be in space so bad. My desktop right now on my computer is a picture of an astronaut, a little guy just floating above the earth. I love it. But one of the things that always scared me is the idea that in space, if you're, you're out doing your spacewalk and you accidentally push off, you're a goner. There's nothing to stop you. There's, there's no other force that can stop you. You're just a goner. And the sad, scary thing about humanity is that we pushed off. We had all the security and safety in the world and we pushed off. And we do it every day. We, we had all this goodness. And at some point or another, we established the I want I. And so we pushed off. We said, I don't need you. And then in short order, we realized what we had done. And I, I, I have no way to get back. Even if I want to, I have no way to get back to God. I'm just gone. I am without hope. And God sent his son from the same place that I had left. From the same place that I had pushed off from, God sent his son, Jesus. And to his own detriment, he pushed off. And he caught up with Nick and he threw me back to goodness. To his own detriment. And he found you and he threw you back to safety and forgiveness and peace and love and mercy. To his own detriment. To his death on the cross. And that is a good news. Because everything you ever feared has been conquered. Everything you were ever worried about has been done away with. Every sin you have ever committed that you confess, he has tossed as far as the east is from the west. Those are his words, not mine. Regardless of what you have ever done, this Lent or in your whole life, no matter how thick your notebook would be, the good news is that he is utterly merciful. He is unconditionally loving. If you will turn to him. So we get the word pardon. You know what a pardon is? Where you're let go of something that you were actually tied to. That a consequence you should have had is released from you. Catechism 14.22 says, Those who approach the sacraments of penance obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him and are at the same time Reconciled with the church which they have wounded. When we sin, as part of the body, we wound not only our relationship with God, we wound the church. When I make a mistake, when I'm a jerk to my kids, when I do worse, I harm you. But when I approach the confessional and I hit my knees and I say it out loud, eye to eye with my Savior, what I did, I come out stronger than I could have ever been, and you are stronger than you could have ever been. When we, as the members of the body, open ourselves to God's grace, we strengthen his body on earth, and we walk out the doors, and we transform the lives around us. If we will open ourselves to his grace. I grew up surrounded by missionaries in my church. There were always missionaries from countries all around the globe coming in. And one of the most stark stories I ever heard, they were working with the tribe, that they, they were learning the language out, out in the jungle, and they, they couldn't get across what forgiveness and mercy looks like. And they struggled, they, they tried to tell them, like, the bad things you've done, you know, you're forgiven. Well, what is forgiven? And they were struggling with it, and one day it came to this, this one missionary. They had a system in their tribe where if somebody wronged you, you would go to your tent, your hut, and you would take a wooden peg and you would nail it in the wall. And it would constantly remind you of what they had done to you. So every wrong you committed, there was another nail. There was another peg in the wall. These wooden pegs. So these people in their homes would have a huge wall of pegs. So I know what she did to me. I know what he did to me. And I'm not going to let it go. They had a record of wrongs. And this missionary one day said, I got it. You, God has many, many pegs on you. You have, you have offended God, you've hurt God, you've hurt others. He has endless pegs on you. And he was in his hut, and he swiped them off the wall. And God has pulled out all of your pegs. 
He's not keeping any record of what you've done. If you'll just turn to him. And like the whole tribe converted. They understood what grace and mercy, and they were dying for it. Because otherwise their whole life was accented by people being mean to them. To the infractions against them. Their whole life, they didn't have any sort of grace. They wanted it. They would want the pegs to go away, but they couldn't. And they learned what pardon means. Our goal, brothers and sisters, in Lent is not to stop needing grace. Ever. Ever, ever. Our goal is to get to the point where we stop fighting grace. Our goal in life, our only real goal in the end, is to pick up our feet and float down. Our only goal is to pick up our own feet and our, you know, get, stop planting the feet of what we want, stop looking around, and just put our eyes up and float where His mercy wants to take us. To say, okay, if you don't want to keep a record of wrong, I accept. Please forgive me. And he pulls out the pegs and He wipes you clean, and you come out of confession, you come away from the Eucharist, you come away from the sacraments, holy, divine. One step closer to sainthood. One step closer to your heart beating with what you were made to be. And that rhythm, that heartbeat is mercy. And it's not that you stop needing grace. You're alive because of grace. You are in grace. You're floating down the river of grace. And all is well. All is well. And so this Lent, I was trying to think of the best way to close... And I think I'm allowed to say these words if I don't do any action. But I want you to hear in this removed context what the priest says to you after you confess. God, the Father of mercy, through the death and the resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.